Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be talking about the topic on everyone's mind, which is Uber's valuation and its recent IPO. And we're going to be discussing specifically whether or not the company is overvalued as many people on the market think. Now, before we begin, I want to give this disclaimer and say that this is just for informational and illustrative purposes. This is just my opinion based on my analysis. Do not regard this as investment advice. Do not regard it as a recommendation before doing any of that, talk with a qualified professional and do your own homework first. So is Uber overvalued? The short answer is yes, which is a big reason why its IPO went very poorly. Now, there is a small chance that Uber's current share price, as I record this in the middle of May of 2019, is appropriate at $40 to $50. But we think that it's more likely the company is actually worth between $10 and $20 per share, so less than half of its current share price. And there's also a decent probability that it's worth zero, so nothing at all. Reframing this, you could think of it as maybe 10 to 15% potential upside and more like 50 to 75% potential downside. For the company to be valued appropriately in the share price range of $40 to $50, which is where it's at right now, you have to make some very optimistic assumptions. And you also have to believe that its minority stake investments in other ride-sharing companies are worth what Uber claims they're worth, or possibly even more than that. So that's the short answer to this question. In this tutorial, we're going to cover quite a bit, including a full Excel model and valuation for Uber, we're also going to reference specific pages of their S1. You can look at my highlighted sections with the links below this video as well. So we're going to go through all that and we'll start by talking about how to think about Uber at a high level in part one. In part two, we'll go through the scenarios and the free cash flow projections that we use in our DCF analysis for Uber here. In part three, we'll talk about the discount rate and how we can come up with estimates for that for a company like this. And then in part four, We'll go through the terminal value calculations and some of the valuation conclusions we can draw. And then in part five, I'll explain why I'm not shorting Uber despite all this and despite the fact that I strongly suspect the company is significantly overvalued right now. Let's go to part one now and talk about Uber at a high level. So the first question you need to ask is what kind of company is it? Is it a transportation company? Is it a marketplace company like eBay and Etsy that simply connects buyers and sellers? Is it a food delivery company like Grubhub? We don't know exactly, but we'd say it's probably some combination of all of these. It's growing very quickly. It's also losing massive amounts of money and it has elements of all these different markets and company types embedded within it. So our approach will be to think about where the company is today and then in the long term, over the next 15 or 20 years, which mature companies it will resemble in that future. And then once we figure that out, we'll forecast its users, its trips, its bookings, its revenue, and its margins so that the long-term picture over the next 10 to 20 years is consistent with those more mature companies. Now, Uber's S1 IPO filing is almost useless. It's 396 pages of data and disclosures, but a lot of the data is actually fairly useless. If you look at it closely, they throw a lot of facts and numbers and figures at you. But in a lot of cases, they're giving you information that is not really presented in a useful way. For example, they tell you nothing about user acquisition costs. So yes, they have an item for selling general and administrative expenses, but they don't link it to the users or drivers or anything like that. Revenue, trips, and bookings are shown, but they're not broken out by ride sharing versus Uber Eats for each of their regions. This is significant because you could argue that in places like the US, Europe, and Canada, Uber's growth is really slowed down. And so if they want to keep growing, it's going to have to be in markets like India and Latin America and Africa and other emerging markets like that. So the fact that they're not breaking it out by region here and putting it in an easy to understand format is a big red flag. Fixed versus variable expenses are unclear. Specifically, the company has this one line item called unallocated research and development and general and administrative and other expenses which go into that. And it's not clear exactly how this corresponds to the number of drivers or the number of users they have, or if it's just a fixed expense that grows at a specific rate. So there is a lot of uncertainty around that. They also don't give us retention rates for drivers, passengers, 
even restaurants for its Uber Eats division. So the bottom line is there is a lot of missing information here, and we're going to have to make some very rough guesstimates to complete this analysis. For the company's revenue, we link it to the number of active users they have, what they call monthly active platform consumers. Each of them on average takes a certain number of trips each year. The company earns a certain dollar amount for each trip, and then the user pays a certain amount for each trip, and then Uber. So on the revenue side, we're going to link this to the number of active users they have, what they call monthly active platform consumers. Each user on average takes a certain number of trips per year, they pay a certain amount per trip, and then Uber gets a certain percentage of each trip. This is called the take rate. Now, when we make assumptions for revenue, we also want to do a sanity check and look at items like the total number of users as a percent of the total population in the countries in which Uber operates. Because if they only have one or 2% of the total population right now, they're probably not gonna get to say 50%, but maybe they can go up to 5% or 10%. And then we also look at total bookings as a percent of their serviceable addressable market. Because again, if they're only serving 5% in the market right now and 50 or 60% of people are never going to use it because they have to drive a long way and Uber doesn't really make sense, then you can't really make the assumption that they're going to capture 50% in the market, but maybe they can get to 8% or 10% or something like that. On the expense and margin side, if you look at mature marketplace and transportation companies, often their margins are in the 10 to 15% range. Just to show you an example of that, if we go into our Excel file here and we look at some of our mature marketplace companies, we see EBITDA margins of 17%, 30%, 34%. So they're actually quite high for the internet-based businesses. But for the transportation-based businesses, they're quite a bit lower. We see margins of 5%, 8%, 12%, 19%, 14%. .9%, some are above 20%, but the median is around 15% right here. So we assume that over the long term, the company gets up to that range. We are not factoring in anything about self-driving cars because there's too little information it would be too speculative, the entire business model would change. So we're going to assume that Uber pretty much continues operating as is, maybe with some of the benefit and added margins from more automation in the future. Let's go into part two now and talk about the scenarios for ride sharing and Uber Eats. So right up here in the top part of our Excel file, we have population in countries of operation, which we assume grows at about 3% per year because of countries like India and Nigeria and others in Africa that are growing at a faster rate. We also have our monthly active platform users, and we've assumed growth rates for this in the upside, base, and downside cases. In the base case, this goes up to about 5% of the total population in the countries of operation. So 371 million users, which represents about 5% of the 7.4 billion people that will be there in 20 years. Each of these users takes a certain number of trips per year. It starts off around 57. And then regardless of the case, we assume that it goes up and roughly doubles and goes up to about 120 trips per year by the end of this 20 year period. Then we have an average bookings per trip. Now, this one decreases slightly because the company directly states this in its filings. It says in its S1 filing that it expects its bookings per trip will decrease because of its expansion into emerging markets and because it's getting into new lines of business that will probably have a lower fee per use than its existing ride sharing business. Now, eventually this still ends up rising, but it only goes up to around 1123 by the end of the period in the base case. So based on all that, we can take our total annual trips, which is based on our active users times the annual trips per user. Then we can take our bookings per trip and we can multiply our annual trips by our bookings per trip and get to our gross bookings like that. It starts off around 50 billion historically, goes up to 64, 65 billion. Then by the end of the base case, it goes up to almost 500 billion, which is about 9% of the total addressable serviceable market right here. We assume initially that Uber gets around 20% of that, which explains our revenue right here, but that by the end, it falls to only around 16.5% because again, in divisions like Uber Eats, the take rate is just not as high and they're not able to charge as much. And again, they state all this directly in their filing. So if you look at everything together here, in the downside case, 
Uber gets up to around 4% of the population in the countries in which it operates. In the upside case, it's more like 10%. The base case is somewhere in the middle, but a little bit closer to the downside case. The average bookings per trip grow in all the cases, but they grow a whole lot more in the upside case than they do in the downside or base cases. And then if you look at the gross bookings here, we go from 1% of the serviceable market right now to 6% in the downside case, to more like 9% in the base case, and more like 20% in the upside case. The take does not differ. We assume it declines in all cases because of the expansion into emerging markets and the expansion of its Uber Eats business. And the revenue differs by quite a bit, 59 billion in year 20 versus 82 billion versus 195 billion in the upside case. The core platform contribution margin, so the segment level operating margin for just the ride sharing and Uber Eats business goes to 10% in the long term in the downside case, 13% in the base case, and more like 15% in the upside case. And these assumptions give us implied share prices of around 10 or 11 in the downside case, about 17 to 20 in the base case, and about 40 to 46 in the upside case. Now, the next set of assumptions here is for Uber Freight, which is a smaller division, but a quickly growing one, and also for the entire company as a whole. For Uber Freight, here, their initial serviceable addressable market is just the US freight trucking market, which they state in their IPO filing. They add the European market in fiscal 2019, and we assume a 3% growth rate for this market overall. Right now, they're penetrating very little of it, less than 0.1%. We assume it goes up and up, and that by the end, they penetrate anywhere from 1.2% to about 2.15% of this market, depending on the case that we're in, and that by the end, the contribution margin also ranges from 10% to 15%, depending on the case that we're in, which, again, ties in directly to the margin of those mature trucking and transportation companies that I showed you earlier. So all those assumptions are laid out right here. And then as far as the other key assumptions, so you can see our company-wide free cash flow projections right down here. The key thing to note is that the ending operating margin and ending revenue numbers are quite different. The revenue here in the base case goes up to about 113 billion with an operating margin of about 6.5% for the company as a whole. This is mostly because these unallocated expenses as a percent of revenue, we assume, decrease pretty significantly. They've already fallen from 50% to about 27%, and we assume they fall even further down to about 3% by the end. The company keeps investing in new technologies like the self-driving cars, but they don't necessarily go all in on them, and as a percent of revenue, these expenses decline. One final point here before moving on. The company also has a significant balance of net operating losses. We assume a number of about 5.1 billion here, but if you look in the filings, they actually have more like 10 billion. Just to show you where this is, they state on one page here that they have US federal NOL carry forwards, US state NOL carry forwards, and some foreign numbers as well. The problem though, is that if you keep looking in their filings, they only list a very small portion of that number on their balance sheet. Now, if you assume a 25% tax rate, 25% times 10 billion is 2.5 billion, but they only list less than half of that. The reason is because many of their NOLs start expiring this year, 2019. Therefore, the NOLs on its balance sheet are much lower than 25% times 10 billion. And in our projections, we only factored in the federal NOLs because they last a lot longer. The expiration starts at a later date. We also allow new NOLs to be created and we assume NOL usage once the operating income term is positive. Also at the end, we add the present value of remaining NOLs in year 20 to calculate the implied enterprise value. So let's take a look at this. You can see initially here, we do create some NOLs and I'll set up a frame so you can see this a bit better. So when the company's operating income is still negative, we create NOLs each year. Then when it turns positive, we start using up those NOLs. And then in the base case here, you can see that nothing remains at the very end. Of course, this changes in the downside case, but if you go up to the terminal value and the implied enterprise value calculations, we don't have anything here for the present value of this NOL balance in the base case. If we change it to the downside case though, now we get something. It's relatively small, but it's still worth including even if it's a very small number by the end. So that's a little bit about the free cash flow projections and the scenarios here. Let's now talk about the discount rate. So in a sense, this is actually the easy part. 
because we can't use obviously similar companies like Lyft or Didi in China, Grab, Yandex Taxi in Russia, Kareem in the Middle East and North Africa, because they're either not public or they're simply too new as public companies in the case of Lyft. So there's just not enough data to, to calculate beta yet. Instead, we took an approach where we looked at three groups of companies, high growth marketplaces, such as Shopify, Etsy, and Grubhub, and some other companies, which you can see here, mature marketplaces like eBay, cars.com, and Shutterstock, and then trucking and logistics companies like Night Swift, JB Hunt, Hertz, Schneider, and so on and so forth. Now, these company groupings all trade at very different multiples, and they have very different margins and revenue growth rates. Just to show you an example, let's go into our WAC calculation here and take a look at this. So if we look at the high growth marketplace companies, revenue growth of over 30%, EBITDA margins of 15%, and 6x and 32x multiples for revenue and EBITDA. If we look at the more mature marketplace companies, revenue growth of 2%, EBITDA margins of 30%, and multiples of 3 to 4x and about 10 to 11x for revenue and EBITDA respectively. And then if we go down once again for these trucking and logistics companies, revenue growth of 5%, EBITDA margins of 15%, multiples of 1.2x, so between one and two x we could say, and enterprise value to EBITDA multiples of around eight, nine, or 10x. The amazing thing is that despite all these differences, if you calculate WAC using the traditional method, it doesn't really differ that much between these groupings. So if we look at the high growth marketplace companies, we get an implied WAC of around nine to 9.5%. And then if we look at the more mature marketplace companies and the transportation companies, we get to a WAC of between 8.5% and 9%. So it's a little bit different as we'd expect. It is lower for these more mature companies, but it's not like we're talking about a difference of 10% versus 5% or 15% versus 10%. It's nothing close to that really. So the bottom line is that we just started WAC at 9.36% and made it decline to 8.75% over time so that Uber reaches maturity by year 20. And if you look at that in our cash flow projections, right here, you can see the approach used. We start the discount rate at 9.36%, we make it decline each year, and then it reaches 8.75% by the end. And we use this cumulative discount factor to take the present value of the free cash flows in each year. The cost of debt here took a bit of guesswork. It is very unclear exactly what the company will look like, especially post IPO. In a couple of places, they do list their capital structure, but if you look at what they're actually saying here, they give actual and pro forma and then pro forma as adjusted. And they seem to be implying that they're going to repay a lot of their convertible notes and their redeemable convertible preferred stock and other items like that. So the bottom line is we pretty much just use these pro forma as adjusted numbers and we've taken the interest rates from their filings and we factored in a few other items, but there's a fair amount of guesswork here. So the cost of debt is probably a little bit off. You can see our calculation for it right over here. We've made some assumptions for the convertible notes that they're using to fund their purchase of a minority stake in Kareem. We've made some assumptions for the capital leases and for the remaining tranches of debt. We get a pretty high pre-tax cost of debt, but that's not necessarily wrong for a high risk company like this. We would expect the cost of debt to be quite a bit higher. Let's now go into part four and talk about the terminal value and the valuation conclusions here. So the terminal growth rate is 0% to 2% depending on the case that we're in. You can see all of our cases lined up right here at the top. The terminal multiple is 6.6X to 8.7X this is very similar to what we saw for those mature trucking and logistics companies and even for some of the mature marketplace companies so that's how we're calculating it the present value of the free cash flow in the forecast period is actually negative in the base and downside cases so this analysis is highly dependent on the terminal value and also on uber's own current balance sheet just to show you an example of this in the base case right now, the sum of the present value of free cash flows is around negative 2.3 billion. So the terminal value, the present value of the terminal value adds a huge amount to this. And so do the cash and the equity investments on the company's balance sheet. Now, if we change this to the downside case, it looks even worse. 
the sum of the present value of free cash flows is negative 10 billion. So the terminal value adds something to that, but then really most of the value is coming from what is on the company's current balance sheet. I'll change it back to the base case for now. The share count is also a little bit murky. We tried to make our own best estimate, which came out to around 1.8 to 1.9 billion, fully diluted. But again, the filing is confusing and they're not clear about exactly which shares will end up contributing to this. So we made our best guess for this one. The bottom line is that the base and downside cases here imply a range of about 10 to $20 per share. The upside case is more like 40 to $50 per share. Just to go down and show you what this looks like in our sensitivity tables, you can see here that our upside case goes from about 40 to more like 46, but we'll be generous and call it 50. The base case goes from about 16.7 to more like 18.48. And the downside case goes from about 10 to more like 11 or just above 11. And then you can also see it if we calculate terminal value using a terminal multiple down here instead, which is pretty much the same range. But it's important to note that really all these cases are somewhat optimistic because we assume that the company eventually turns cash flow positive. If it doesn't, then its core business is essentially worth nothing and its equity value is being propped up only by the cash and the equity investments on its balance sheet. So ironically, despite the fact that Uber is a tech company, in more pessimistic cases, you would almost value the company with something resembling a liquidation valuation where it's solely based on the assets and liabilities on its balance sheet and what the fair market value of those assets and liabilities is. That's it for part four. Let's go to the last segment here now and talk about why I'm still not shorting Uber despite this and despite the fact that we feel very strongly that it is overvalued at the moment. The real problem in this valuation is the part at the end where we go from implied enterprise value to implied equity value. 71% of the company's implied equity value in the base case is coming from what's currently on its balance sheet, specifically the cash and cash equivalents and equity investments. Now we've taken the numbers directly in their filings to get these, but how much are companies like DD, Grab, Yandex Taxi, and Cream actually worth? Does anyone even know what they're actually worth? It seems like many of these companies are pretty similar to Uber financially speaking. For example, DD in China lost about $1.6 billion in 2018 alone. So by longing or shorting Uber, you're not really betting on just the company itself. You're really longing or shorting the entire ride sharing sector. If we imagine this sector as a house of cards, Kareem, Didi, Grab, and Yandex Taxi are at the bottom. Then somewhere in the middle is the viability of the ride-sharing business model as a whole. And then at the top is Uber. And so you can see how if any one of these individual elements, these cards in the middle, collapse, then Uber is probably going to collapse as well. On the other hand, if it turns out more positive than expected, and this goes from a house of cards into a legitimate business with a strong foundation, then Uber will be even stronger as well. So the bottom line is that since this is a bet on an entire sector, it's much harder than saying one specific company is overvalued or undervalued. Remember that mispriced companies can stay mispriced for years until a catalyst comes along and makes everyone realize it. Now, this could happen for Uber. For example, they could report poor earnings, they could write down some of their investments, they could report slower than expected growth, but it's hard to pinpoint the exact timing and magnitude for something like this. Even if self-driving cars happen anytime soon, I don't think this changes the picture that much because their operating expenses will, shift, will simply shift to capital expenditures as they spend a huge amount to buy all these cars, presumably. And even if that happens, their free cash flow margins may still not turn positive for a long time to come, which takes us to the same place. Yes, eventually in 20 years time, they might be very free cash flow positive, but for the next five or 10 years, nothing significant is going to change and they're going to struggle to ever have positive free cash flow. We're at the end, so let's do a recap and summary now. In part one, we talked about how to think, Uber, think about Uber at a high level. It is a bit of a transportation company, a bit of a marketplace company, and it's a mix between the high growth companies and the more mature companies in those segments. We looked at different scenarios here, the downside case, the base case, and the upside case, and we created different free cash flow projections for all of them. We tried to ground these projections in actual numbers. So for example, we know that eBay's total users are about seven to 
of the population in the countries in which it operates. So for Uber, we tried to make sure that its active users go from anywhere from 2% right now to 4%, 5%, all the way up to 10%, depending on the case, over a 20-year time frame. For the discount rate calculation, we looked at those three groupings of companies, high growth marketplace companies, mature marketplace companies, and transportation companies. And we based the numbers for beta and cost of equity on that. Then we calculated terminal value using growth rates and multiples, again, linked to the comparables and overall economic growth rates and drew some conclusions. And you saw how in the upside case, yes, their current share price might be justified. In the base and downside cases, we think the company is worth more like between $10 to $20 per share, which implies about 50 to 75% downside from their current share price range. And then finally explain why I'm not shorting Uber despite all this. It's so speculative that by buying a share in Uber, you are essentially buying a share in the entire ride sharing sector, which could be very negative if everything comes tumbling down like a house of cards, but which could also be positive if these companies manage to turn themselves around and become positive cash flow generators, especially if it happens sooner than expected. So that's it for our evaluation of Uber. I hope you've learned a little bit more about how to think about a more complex company like this with a lot of different divisions, stakes in other companies, and also a company that is likely to change significantly in future years.